as I've shown you in the previous video, I found a fragment of Chernobyl's nuclear fuel. So now it's actually time to mess around with it, take a look with the Gamma Scout. That's a good demonstration of the inverse square law. Uh, the dose rate, of course, is very high when you're very close to the detector. But as the tube is overflowing, the dose is actually much higher, as is displayed here, because of the very high dead time of the detector currently. The Gamma Scout is only calibrated to measure up to 1 millisievert per hour. So um, as it displays close to 90 millisievert per hour, that means the dose rate is quite far off. And that is from this tiny little fuel fragment. It's incredible. Unbelievable. <laughs> After such a long time, this tiny little speck of nuclear fuel emits that much radiation. But enough toying around with Geiger counters. Let's have a look at it with a sodium iodide gamma spectrometer. This is my portable gamma spectrometer, the Gamma Spectacular, connected to a laptop using a sodium iodide crystal that is about two inches big. Well, more like in diameter. And uh, this is just background more or less, as the fuel spec is still on the envelope just to the left of the laptop. So I'm going to grab this envelope and move it over to the detector, which is on the right of the laptop. And you can see a spike coming up there. This large spike is the cesium-137 peak at 662 keV, kilo electron volts. And that is the very characteristic, typical the gamma line from season 137. And here's the tiny fuel fragment again for your viewing pleasure. And now let's take a look at the gamma spectrum again. You can see the season 137 peak as the largest elevation there. And uh, there's also, let's speed things up a bit, there's also a quite weird continuum just to the right of that peak. And that is actually because the detector is overflowing. So uh, let's, let's have a look at it again, but with a distance of about 20 centimeters from detector to the source, because the source is just too hot. So here's the faulty spectrum again. You can see that to the right of the cesium-137 photo peak, we have a weird continuum of sorts. That is probably because uh, the high voltage is, uh, well, dropping randomly because the, the pulse rate inside the detector is so incredibly high that we have a distorted non-linear gain and uh, it just leads to, to random impulses and random channels uh, and not the, the expected season 137 photo peak. So what one can do when this happens is to move the source away from the detector so that we have a normal pulse rate and this will be the following spectrum, what you can see now. The cesium 137 photo peak, totally as expected, a very high peak with a flattening out on the, the right of the peak and to the left of the peak you can see the Compton continuum. Uh, these two edges, the first or leftmost edge is the backscatter peak and then comes the, uh, the Compton edge and after the Compton edge the Compton valley and the actual cesium-137 photo peak. Let's take a closer look at the leftmost bit of the spectrum with the cesium-137 photo peak here. And uh, the, the colored bars you can actually see are from a previous energy calibration. So the large blue area, uh, the region of interest, used to be my cesium-137 photo peak when I calibrated it at home. But the problem is that uh, you really shouldn't switch off spectrometers at all, not even sodium iodide spectrometers, because what happens if you do is that you will have to reperform an energy calibration. And apparently I could not take random radioactive sources on the plane and fly with them to Kiev and go to Chernobyl with them. So the calibration is quite far off, but that's where the fuel fragment actually comes in handy because it's actually a perfect calibration source with the cesium-137 photo peak, which is more uh, to the left now than it used to be before when I calibrated the detector at home. But yeah, this randomly shows you the importance of not switching off your detector if that is possible. Well, this is all quite good and stuff, but uh, of course it would be better to measure it again at home with a lead shielding and probably even a better detector, but well, we can't really take that fuel fragment out. So what can we do? What would be legal and what, what would be undetectable? Well, quite simply, taking a tiny little swipe 
that has a total activity of less than 200 BKRL, so it is within the list of exome quantities for any present nucleids, and it is so small and so low in, it in activity that it cannot be found. So what you can see here is this tiny little swipe, and uh, I have measured it at home with the same detector again, but with a huge latch yielding, and uh, the red area is actually the background for the same amount of time, for 7200 seconds of measuring this tiny thing, and you can see we get a similar spectrum if we just wait long enough. But now, wouldn't it be better if we had a better detector, such as a very high energy resolution detector, maybe a high purity germanium detector, and measure it for a long time? Well, I did exactly that. Let's have a look at it. So here's the spectrum of the fuel swipe, as seen by a high purity germanium detector. On the top you can see the whole spectrum as is, there's a huge uh, cesium-137 peak, but I cancelled that out for this region of interest, which is shown uh, pretty much zoomed in on the bottom here, because it would be so high that you can hardly see all of the other peaks. So uh, this display is in linear scale, it is a measurement of 120,000 seconds, which is over 30 hours to pr produce the spectrum, because as I said the activity is very low, but if you wait just long enough, it will get very good results as well. So what you can see here, these two waves that are of the Compton Continuum of the cesium-137 peak, which is not shown here, but you can see the beautiful backscatter peak and the uh, Compton Edge, followed by the Compton Valley, as before. And then you can see uh, on the very left, a very typical nuclei to be present, americium 241 a daughter of plutonium, and uh, it is present in a, well, sort of high activity. So uh, that is definitely quite interesting. And what we can also see is uh, identified peaks of europium isotopes here. And if we take a look at the other side of the spectrum, to the right of the major cesium-137 peak, we can see many more uh, peaks identified with uh, europium, or associated with europium-154. So it's quite likely that this is actually true, and it's an isotope of europium, the europium-154 that is present in here. I'm not too sure about the sodium-22, that is not very typical, so maybe that's a peak that also belongs to europium, because there's one gamma line that is quite close to this sodium-22 peak, uh, that actually belongs to europium as well. And of course there's potassium-40, potassium-40 is just in everything, and you can see it here as well. By the way, this, um, this spectrum is with a subtracted background, so it shows the actual true reading that only comes from the uh, from the sample, from the little field swipe, and not from everything that is around it, so the background radiation, keep that in mind. Here's the spectrum again in logarithmic view, so uh, you can make out the tiny peaks with low activity better. And you can see, well, it's still quite the same, it's just for your viewing pleasure. Left to the cesium-137 peak, and right to the cesium-137 peak. And yeah, I think it's quite an interesting spectrum. I've never seen europium isotopes on a gamma spectrometer, so that was new to me, and I think it's absolutely beautiful. What's also beautiful is uh, ionizing radiation striking a camera CCD, and that's just what you can see here. Let's have a look at it in slow motion as well. This is what happens if the camera is very close to that little speck of fuel. Hope you enjoyed, and thanks for watching.